ai pai pai te pai te koro ki a kotso i tēnei wā nui ngā mihi. Jenny Lee Morgan Thorg Lienwa, he uri tēnei no Waikato Tainui, ko ngā mahutsa te ahiwaru e tahi o ngā hapu, he ko Makaurau Marae, ko Tanifa Marae, e tahi o aku Marae, he hātu. Toko whitu a maua ko Iruera, a maua tamariki, toko rua ngā mokopuna tēnei wā, nō reira tino waimari e mātou. Ai, koi nana ke tēnei wā, tēnā kotu. Kei te whare wānau o Wairaka ahau, tēnei wā, kei Unitec, nō reira kei te whakaaro tonu wau mō ngā mō te manaki tanga o ngā tini iwi o tēnei wāhi, te awa e rere mai nei te unu te unu wai, te unu roa o Wairaka, ngā maunga e tāwharai nei. Hoia nō, ko te tūmano, ko kua tai mai te manaki tango te runga rawa, kei rungi a kōtou, he rangi pai hua rere tēnei, mā mātou kei tāmaki, ko te manako, kei te mahana kōtou, i o kōtou kāinga tēnei wā. Ai, kia ora. Kia ora koutou, lovely to see everyone's faces. It's a bit daunting uh, having a corridor like this and um, not being able to really know who's in the room except that you are all interested in postgraduate studies and I um, want to acknowledge you all for being on this journey, whether it's at a master's level or doctoral level. Um, just before I begin, just wanted to acknowledge Kelsey uh, Almaiki Wairaka uh, coordinator, and we're really lucky to um, have a mai site at uh, Te Whare Wānanga o Wairaka and also acknowledge our Maya um, staff, Māori staff here, Dai, Darlene and Kat, who work with our Māori postgraduate students um, here at Unitec. So, um, ai, ngā mihi to all of you. Um, I can't remember what I called this session, Kelsey, but it was an opportunity really to reflect on uh, kaupapa Māori in postgraduate studies and really to ref uh, an opportunity for me to go back to uh, thinking about what I did in my postgraduate studies and how I learned to think about and progress, if you like, kaupapa Māori in an, in an effort that that might be uh, useful to you. For those of you who know some of my work, um, I've methodologically I've done some work in Pūrākai and so often there's a lot of storytelling and with a Pūrākai pedagogy, you know, things aren't always made explicit, rather they're implicit and I think that's a very Māori way of talking, a very Māori way of being. And so often we come to um, quarter or lectures or presentations like this, and, and we want to know the answers. We, we've got a short time span, you know, I'm, I appreciate that all of you are busy, you've made this time in your day and you're here, and you really need to know what you need to know so that you can go on and now write, continue writing your chapter or whatever it is you're on. Um, and one of the challenges for us as Māori is to really just be in that time be in that moment and en enable yourself to reflect on those things that are being uh, shared with you. Um, the people in the room, the virtual room, uh, the wairua, the place that you're in, whether in terms of the whenua, uh, the manaki tanga of those around you. So, um, I, I just want to say that as a preface, because uh, for those of you who are hoping to go away with potentially lots and lots of quotes and references, you may be a little bit disappointed, but really invite you to um, share in the story that I had at uh, my journey as a doctoral uh, postgraduate student, and hope that there might be some gleanings in there for you. Um, I'm not very technologically savvy, so I'm going to try and share my screen. Kelsey's going to help me out. Oh, 
that will take us here. Uh -huh. Slide show. Okay. So I just, um, so you know, we are at Te Whariwana Ngā Wairaka and have um, a research centre here called Ngā Wairate Tui. Um, as you would expect, I began with um, a mihi and I'm sure if we had time, that's what we would all do in this session, is that we would have an opportunity to mihi to each other. And I just really want to spend some time just on that one idea, because that is really uh, important to us culturally, to mihi to each other, to not only mihi to each other, but to um, those who have gone before us, uh, those who, um, you know, are in the room, those whom aspirations you carry, so the past, uh, the present and the future, to mihi to um, our deities, to Rangi and Papa, to Ngā Maunga, to the Awa. And I think um, that act of mihi and culturally locating yourself not just in our practices, but in our academic work is really important. Uh, so I really want to just focus on these three things um, in, in reflecting on my postgraduate journey is the need to culturally locate yourself in your work. You know, as Kaupapa Māori um, researchers, we know uh, we reject this idea of objectivity and that uh, we are the objective researcher that's coming in and going to do this research. And in fact, we say, no, we are Māori and, and we are locating ourselves in the, these ways. And so um, it's really important to, to take the time to, to understand what that means for you. What does it mean for you to culturally, culturally locate yourself as a researcher? And there are a myriad of ways of doing that. I don't think that's a set format. I think that whether you uh, locate yourself, um, our whānau, our kuku, our iwi, our Māori, um, as uh, with the multiple identities that we have. So uh, the way in which you culturally locate yourself will be really critical in your analysis going forward as a kaupapa Māori researcher. So instead of seeing it as sort of something I'm going to flip through really quickly, this is who I am, done that piece, now I'm on to my lit review. Uh, thinking about who you are in terms of your whānau, your hapū history and bringing your iwi and, and choosing whether, you know, how that is placed in your analysis uh, is really important. So just to, um, oh, I don't know how to go to the, oh. so just by way of um, culturally locating myself and the, um, my master's work was about uh, Ma being Māori Chinese. Kelsey, I'm not sure if you can see, can people see me when I'm talking or just my screen? Um, I can see both. Um, it depends on their settings, I guess. They should be able okay. to see you because I just wanted to show you the book, if people can see it. Um, so my master's thesis was called um, Māori Chinese Identity and Schooling in Aotearoa. And I was really interested in uh, being Māori Chinese. So this is my whānau, my dad's side of my whānau. Um, this is my dad here. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. Sorry. Can you see the cursor? That's my dad. <laughs> um, that's my dad, David Lee. This is, huh? This is my grandmother, Kahu Kahu, who my, one of my daughters is named after. Kahu Kahu, Nana Kahu Kahu grew, grew up in Ihumata. Uh, she married, her second husband was my, my Chinese grandfather here. Uh, his name is Jin Sit Lee. And next to my grandfather is my great-grandmother, Nana Hinganoho. Uh, 
uh, Nana Hingo, Hinga Noho um, was 107 when she died and uh, lived to a grand age. This next to her is my Ngāpuhi uh, grandmother. My grandfather married twice. This was his second wife and her name is Mata Wihungi and she's from Kaikohe and she's um, buried in the uh, uh, Wihungi Urupa Nangakahi of Road. And my grandmother died about, probably about 15 years ago now. All of these ones are, are gone now, my, my grandparents. Uh, my father's sisters and brothers along the front and the back. So a very Māori Chinese um, whānau. My mother's family, this is my mum, uh, my mum's Chinese and her parents, my grandfather, arrived in New Zealand about in the 1930s. And then my grandmother came as part of um, a very small group of Chinese refugee women who were allowed into New Zealand. My, grand my mother oh, was the first, um, first one in her family born in New Zealand uh, and first in family to go to university. My grandparents, my Chinese grandparents, are both illiterate in their own language uh, and didn't learn English at all uh, and died in New Zealand. My grandmother died at the age of about 86, I think and um, still couldn't speak English. So, um, so for me, and, and dealing with that first question, just culturally locating myself, what did that mean, actually led me to the topic of my masters which was around Māori Chinese identity. That's how important it was in terms of understanding what I was going to bring to um, this, this space. And at that time, uh, in the early 90s, there wasn't anything written about Māori Chinese. And in fact, um, Māori, you know, it wasn't cool to be Chinese. And well, it wasn't cool to be Māori, well, definitely wasn't cool to be Chinese. Being both was just, you know, it was, you didn't want to tell anyone that. Uh, so it was, um, it was still challenging. It was this challenging kaupapa. And uh, I was really interested in it because I had become a teacher. I went to Waikato University for five years, uh, did a double degree in BA, BA, and became a Māori secondary school teacher. And I was, uh, could see in the first school that I was in, and at that time, Chinese students were just um, coming into New Zealand. Uh, the government had a policy that you had to have money to come in. And so we had a lot of rich Chinese uh, immigrants coming in. And our Māori kids in particular at the school that I was at um, were in, uh, this is urban Auckland, um, a very impoverished part of that suburb. And we had a very rich group of new immigrants coming into our school. So we were juxtaposed in these um, groups in our school, which really was a reflection of society at that time. And we had the politics of the day saying, um, you know, blaming the um, sort of the Asian invasion and, and all of those discourses going on. Um, so, so let me go back. So, um, so that's where I, uh, I was really interested in what it meant to be Māori Chinese and how do schools manage and produce identity. And so that was really became the kaupapa. And I was um, fortunate to, sorry, just mucking around with my screen. I was fortunate to have uh, Linda and Graham Smith and Leonie Pihama, Quinny Jenkins and others at that time as my lecturers. And, you know, really Kaipapa Māori research was being pioneered um, in the academic space. So Linda's questions, which I'm sure you've all seen, but were really uh, critical for me at that time with these. Um, so I show. And they were really, they really helped me think about my kaupapa and still today when I'm doing research really um, become part of the questions that I ask myself. 
What research do we want to carry out? Whom is the research for? What difference will it make? Who will carry out this research? How do we want this research to be done? How will we know it is a worthwhile piece of research? Who will own the research? And most importantly, who will it benefit? And I think uh, even though that these questions were written over 20 years ago, they're still critical for all of us, all of us that are um, undertaking Kaupapa Māori research to, you know, go with good heart to each of these questions and just really think, what does it mean for you? When I thought about doing this Kaupapa around being Māori Chinese, one of the first people that I talked to and uh, in, in order to answer these, this, these questions was my dad. And uh, I, I remember distinctly, and some of you may have heard me tell a story before, um, meeting my dad at a cafe and uh, saying, Dad, I've decided that I want to, um, I'm thinking about doing my thesis topic about being Māori Chinese. What do you think? And being Māori Chinese at school and how schooling, you know, impacted on how we understand ourselves. And I was really um, unprepared for the response that my dad um, gave me. And he started telling me the story about uh, going to intermediate school and his teacher, my dad's name's David Lee, my teacher called, uh, his teacher only used the name Wong to refer to him. He called him Wong the entire schooling year. And I was, um, and my dad was in tears and I was in tears and I just uh, was really moved. I had no idea. I, um, that, that such overt racism in the classroom was endured by my father. And after that conversation with my dad and talking more to him about it, I, I knew that there was an important um, piece of research that needed to be done. Um, I won't go through all these questions, but one of the, the things that I undertook at that time, and, and I don't know, maybe naively, uh, is that I had talked to a number of my uncles and aunties about the research, but I also went to our marae committee. Um, and I went to Makaurau marae, and I, and I went to our marae and I said, this is what I want to do. Um, because I wanted to know if really I was a person to undertake this research. Is, was there someone else that was better or or more appropriate to undertake this research? Could I be entrusted with this work at this time? And uh, I went to the Marae Committee and a uh, Marae meeting and bravely stood up and talked about my work and um, got a lot of support from our Alfano there. Um, now I just want to add probably as a side note, you know, that um, being a Kaipapa Māori researcher has really in lots of ways, even though I'd learned te reo Māori, I had, um, did, did te reo Māori at Waikato, it really in lots of ways led me back to my cultural locatedness. So, um, you know, and I know with some of the studies that we've done, Kaipapa Māori research enables that for us uh, as researchers. So, Sorry, Jean, can I just cut in for a sec? Are you able to either make me the co-host or let um, some people in from the waiting room? Your husband is trying to get in. <laughs> oh, he's late. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, how do I do that? Um, it should say participants. Sorry. Okay. Admit. Admit. Yep. Admit. Cassie, you can reclaim. What was that, sorry? You can reclaim the host. Oh, I have no idea. And participants at the bottom. Hey, kia ora, Eduera. Kotsa, sorry, <laughs> keep you waiting. Tureiti, tureiti kotsa. Hey, thanks for letting me in there, hoa ma. I've uh, <laughs> been waiting out in the cold for the last half hour. Aloha kia tata. Enohoi rotu i te anu mātau. 
Oi anō, ko tāi mai, ko whakatūwhere te a mai te kua hae e koutou. O, oh, aroha atu. Ai. Ka we tukuna ngā manuhiri kia noho mātau. Aroha mai, nā kute he. I was, it's my uh, technical inabilities. Sorry. Um, so. You are, you are slightly forgiven. <laughs> How do I mute people? Okay. You can, right. However, you can redeem yourself. <laughs> now, let's hope this uh, session is going to be thought provoking. <laughs> Kia ora mai. Oh, oops. Oh, no. Um, okay. So, just talking about those uh, questions that Linda set up as, as um, critical, and for those of you who um, have seen them, uh, you know, just important to just keep going back on them and just rethinking that because as your research moves through, and in particular in terms of your methodologies uh, and the way that you will conduct your research, I think they still hold true. Um, the, the second point that I had on that slide that was under me uh, after culturally locating yourself was methodologically locating yourself. And I just want to talk about that quickly. Um. Oh, sorry. So I know this is a long quote by Linda Smith, but I think it, um, it's important. And I also note that it's 20 years old. So, um, you know, there are things that have moved on, but I think for those of us, and I've uh, really positioned this cordial um, as an introductory sort of uh, piece to Kaipapa Māori research, um, and uh, an opportunity for those who are much further through your work as a, as a space to just reflect and take some time out of whatever you're really writing at the moment to reflect about these sort of broader issues. So Linda says in this quote, one of the challenges for Māori researchers has to be to retrieve some space. First, some space to convince Māori people of the value of research for Māori. And I'll just sort of take a minute about on that one. That this idea, um, of convincing our own people about the need for research is, is probably something you've already experienced in your own families as, as uh, academics who are pursuing postgraduate research, whether it be at master's or doctoral level. And people often say, what are you doing? Oh, you're, you're sort of, you know, not quite sure about what you're doing. Um, and they think that you've got a lot of time on your hands, uh, but also, you know, one of the most quoted lines in Linda Smith's book is that first line about research being a dirty word to our Māori people, Māori and Indigenous people. And that is because of the ways research has been a critical tool of colonisation. And as such, we've learned to be mistrustful of research. So as Māori researchers, being really cognizant of that and not perpetuating the colonialism that has been imposed on us, but thinking now about how we can think about research as a tool to be powerful for us, to be, uh, provide evidence, to support uh, policies, arguments, redistribution of resources, um, it is, and I think, you know, that point that Linda makes is still true and you'll hear it today, whether it be in our own homes about, oh, you academics or you researchers just do blah, 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 blah. And I think it's still something that we have to keep um, promoting is the value of research, um, kaupapa Māori research, uh, research that makes a difference. Uh, we have to keep promoting research in our spaces. 
The second point she makes here is second, to convince the various fragmented but powerful research communities of the need for greater Māori involvement in research. Given this was 20 years ago, I hope we're still not having to do this at the same level, but I fear that we are. That still in many of the disciplines that you're in, that we are um, having to advocate, advocate for kaipapa Māori research, for mā tauranga Māori, for our, our philosophies, for our concepts, for our theories. Um, and that is an ongoing struggle. And it's one that um, we're fortunate to reap the benefits of because of those ones like Linda Graham, Leone, Kathy Irwin in education. Um, all of those who have gone on before us have made those sp that space for us. And, and we've got to keep that space open. And in academic, um, in academia, and the academy, the way that you do that is by supporting and citing and referencing those that have gone on to keep making those spaces. If we, I've just read an article where there was something about the Tainui Waka that was a very general, a very, um, a very general sort of <clears throat> um, ref, a quote statement and they referenced it to um, a recent Pākehā PhD graduate. And as someone from Waikato Tainui, you know, I, I, uh, for me, um, that needs to be referenced by our own. If it's our Tainui Waka, then we need to be, you know, and there's lots, it's there's Pei Te Huruni, there's um, a lot of our own people. So, so thinking about um, the way that we keep convincing others about the value of Māori research is to keep building on. And by building on in this academic space is um, understanding, reading other Māori research, other type of Māori research, and citing them and referencing them and thinking about them. Uh, yeah, so that's the, the point that I want to make there. The third that Linda says is to develop approaches and ways of carrying out research which take into account without being limited by the legacies of previous research and the parameters of both previous and current approaches. Now that third point I think is really relevant for all of us as kaupapa Māori researchers and that is um, the progression of kaupapa Māori. Uh, and I was I felt when I got to my doctoral thesis, which is about ako, and I was, and I'm, if I get time, I can talk a little bit about this, but um, really forwarding Purako as methodology was my contribution back to Kaupapa Māori. Uh, and, and at that time, Kaupapa Māori was still really, Kaupapa Māori research theory was still in its, its, really its infancy, infancy. So, um, what could I bring? And, and today there are lots of theories, uh, Kaipapa Māori theories, methodologies, methods that are being promoted. And I think that's a really great thing. So, you know, in terms of your own work, uh, and I want to go back, if I can, how do I do this, Kelsey? To this idea of methodologically identifying yourself. With, which methodologies are you going to be using? Are you going to go back to um, case study and ethnographic inquiry or whatever it might be? And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying if you're a Kaipapa Māori researcher, then there is, um, I'm promoting, I'm encouraging you to also look at how, what that means from a methodological point of view. All good to say, I'm a kaupapa Māori researcher, I'm from Waikato Tainui, and now I'm going to use um, this particular frame, which is from Germany, for example. Uh, how does that, being Māori, and being a kaupapa Māori research, impact on your work and your analysis? Um, Kelsey, you keep time for me. Tell me if I'm going over because I don't want to talk for too long. 
the last one really is this, this third point, kaipapa Māori includes politically positioning yourself. So those are really the three points I want to make in this, um, in this presentation or kōrero, is by saying you are kaipapa Māori researcher and enacting that in your work necessitates a political positioning. And uh, I think, you know, I think that's obvious. Um, I think, and if we go back to Linda's quote about creating space, you know, this the idea of making space is political. You know, when Dame Nader Glavish said Kilda on the phone and nearly got fired for it 30 years ago, saying picking up the phone, uh, picking up the phone and saying Kia ora is a political act, was a political act then and still is now. Similarly, adhering to Kaipapa Māori and saying I'm a Kaipapa Māori researcher is a political act. To follow that through, and if you read, um, as I'm sure you have, those works, especially by Leone Pihama, um, there's a really strong decolonizing um, tenet or principle of Kaipapa Māori research that is really important. So for me, and if I can just move now to um, thinking about moving from my master's uh, work, which, sorry, just to finish that off, um, you know, was it important? Who did it benefit? All of those questions that we started with. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, encouraged to write my thesis at that point by um, the Māori, uh, supported by Ngāpāia Te Māramatanga and um, the Māori, a Chinese uh, poll tax community to write my um, thesis central book, which I did. And, uh, you know, got a lot of um, good feedback from that and just started really sharing the story, sharing the story of being Māori Chinese and saying it's okay to be Māori Chinese, that there is a diversity of being Māori, that we don't all look the same, that we all don't have the same experiences, but nonetheless we are Māori. Um, and that uh, work then um, made its way to a Māori television doko, which my brother helped. Um, do. So I'm sure that your postgrad work, whether it be master's or doctoral thesis, does have other, um, will find other ways to uh, be produced in your community. Okay. So I was just moving to Ako, that's right, the political positioning. Um, I was just going to say around this uh, kaipapa Māori and close political positioning of yourself that that decolonizing, decolonizing part is really important. Um, and when I was looking at Pūrāko, of course I didn't, you know, and I've written a paper about this, it wasn't just, oh, I'm going to start writing stories like, look at the stories our old people wrote and go, okay, I'm going to write a story like that, this very romantic, linear way of thinking, but actually unpacking what happened to us in the storytelling. Why are we reading our stories of Māori and others through the works of non-Māori, like Els and Best? What happened in that recording of those stories to the stories themselves? What did those early so-called scientists do to collect stories. Who did they talk to? Did they talk to women or men? Well, they talked mainly to men. How did they collate stories that were really different because our hapū, our whānau had different versions of, for example, the rona, the story of rona. What did they do? They just made it one, they put it all together, mixed it all up and made one story and produced it. So there was a really important piece around de colonizing the way we think about our own stories and unpacking that. So uh, just to, and I, you know, emphasize that part. Um, just to finish, is that okay, Kelsey? That um, with one of Leone's, sorry, Leone's uh, quotes here, 
type of Māori theory. And I think one of the things that, in my um, experience of supporting and teaching postgraduate students, is that people really struggle with what is type of a Māori theory? Tell us what it is. And what we do know is that it isn't something that is easily defined. It's not a recipe, it's not a formula. Um, you're not going to get the 10 bullet points. Kaipapa Māori is grounded in mātauranga Māori and is informed by mātauranga Māori. And mātauranga Māori, as we know, is as deep, as deep, as deep, as deep as a moana and as high as Ngārangi tu ha ha. So how can you define kaupapa Māori in such a way if it is embedded in mātauranga Māori? And, and those kaupapa Māori um, pioneers understood that. And uh, I think Leone's quote here is useful for us to think about what is, at a very simple level, what is kaupapa Māori theory? Kaipapa Māori theory is a theoretical framework that ensures a cultural integrity is maintained when analysing Māori issues. It provides both tools of analysis and ways of understanding the cultural, political and historical context of Aotearoa. So just wanting to encourage you to bring that Kaipapa Māori theory in whatever domain that you are reading, writing, studying, investigating, that cultural integrity that applies to that kaupapa to your work and really think about what does that mean in your work? Because the last point that Linda made, and this is for all of us, is that it is now incumbent on us as kaupapa Māori researchers you all doing your postgraduate studies are the new wave of kaupapa Māori researchers. It is incumbent on us to grow kaupapa Māori um, because we understand the depth and the diversity. Um, just by way of finishing, just a couple of really um, uh, good sort of starting points for those people who haven't seen these two um, resources. One is the Kaipapa Māori Rangahau Reader and if you go to that link you can click on it and then here you can download the reader and it's got some really sort of old uh, but good, important, um, seminal pieces around Kaipapa Māori research so I just encourage you to do that. Uh, and then the second one is this is a website that I was involved in um, creating 20 years ago, and it was uh, Linda. It was Linda Smith's idea. Oops, I don't want to see that. Uh, and it was aimed at sharing Kaipapa Māori research with community researchers. And so we. Um, we put together this website. Unfortunately, it's gone through a few um, iterations and it doesn't look like what we or originally had it as, but I just want to introduce some key things to it. One is you've got this kōru moving around, which hopefully doesn't make you giddy, but the idea was there's lots of different pieces of the phases of research here and what, the, what we wanted to tell people was that research isn't linear. And I know that you'll often be told, you know, you've got a research question and you do a lip review and then you do a data analysis, are you data gathering and you do data analysis. And while we like linear, actually in the reality, your research goes in and out. Your questions change, you find more information, your motivation, your incentives change, your, you find out new things and it just sort of goes round and round. And that's why you've got this round spinning uh, Kōru here to remind us that it's okay if you started one place and you've got somewhere else and you go around the circle and you come back. I always remember in that first meeting when we had, we had with Linda was this was a key, one of the key things that she wanted to, um, to, to uh, message to us. 
in this website, there's a whole lot of uh, things that are, that are helpful. Um, so just have a play around with it. But one of them are these Vangahoe videos. And I don't think I can get them working at the moment. And you can see our younger selves here. Uh, but if you click on them, if I'll get, I'm not sure if this is going to work, Kelsey. Where do I get ideas from for research? Being, I think being interested about what's happening in the Māori world, being curious, um, having an inquiring sort of spirit about what why things happen the way they happen uh, partly also when you're used to doing that as a way of life as a way of thinking you can it's like you can almost see the future you can see the implications of actions taken now and so what you you know want to do as a researcher is think well in you can see something unfold in Copa for Māori research teams, the ethical... Um, so there's a whole lot of great little clips there that uh, you can listen to because what we wanted to do was while we could write what is Copa for Māori research, when you're wanting to put it in action, there is some complexities and, and things you need to work through. And if you go, like you can see that Leonie here is talking about ethics, methodology, just click on them, have a listen. There's, I think the only piece on ethics is a really good one uh, for those who are of you who are struggling with ethics applications or ethical considerations that are, um, you know, tricky. Uh, so just introducing those two resources to you if you haven't seen them. So, koina um, anake wa, just um, three little thoughts for the day uh, in terms of your own uh, postgraduate study the importance of culturally locating yourself and really what that means in terms of your own whānau, hapu, iwi, and how that cultural location is, comes through to your analysis. Because your analysis is not just a Māori analysis, it's a te arawa, it's a waikato, it's a urban, it's a tāne, it's a whatever analysis. And, and that's okay, and we should be naming those. The more... Um, the clearer we are about the analysis that we're bringing, uh, I, in my view, as a qualitative researcher, the more value the research has. Because we come to the, the story that you're writing with a different sort of truth, right? So that's my first point. The second point was methodologically identifying yourself. As a Kaupapa for Māori researcher, your methodology is critical. So what does that mean? to use Kopa from Māori methodology. How is that different? How does that play out? It's got to be more than a cup of tea and a koha when you do an interview. You know? What are you using? What are your tools for analysis? What are your theories? I've had a, just read a great article about audiori and how audiori and the language in audiori bring um, a whole, open a whole new world of thinking. Um, I also want to, um, and I haven't talked about this, but you know, Atuke Nepe's work, um, who really, I want to say coined the Kaipapa Māori theory, part in education, um, really talks about the importance of real, that you cannot communicate Kaipapa Māori thought unless you are unless you have that uh, real base so i just encourage you to go back and read some of her work because it's critical and and for those of you who've read you know my work and, and others it's always um comes back to the real what's in our real and what concepts and thinking uh, does our real provide us with it has to be there and the third thing that I finished with was the, just the politicisation, uh, the political nature. You know, that kaipapa Māori um, is a, a, uh, requires a political positioning. So being really clear about that uh, and, and thinking about what the implications of that are uh, and the decolonising work that's necessary. It doesn't have to be a huge piece, but it needs to be there. If I'm marking a Kaipapa Māori research thesis 
and it has doesn't have anything on the decolonizing piece that is you move straight from a to b without thinking what happened in the middle um that's in my view a clear gap in your in your thinking and your writing so koina na ki tēnei wā, um, looking forward to all uh, the amazing work that everyone's doing and reminding everyone that, uh, as Leone said, always said to me, you know, being at this level uh, is a privilege. Only 2% of all of those people enroll, enrolled in bachelors get to go on to do doctorates and that uh, this is not something that any of you I know have, this is not a luxury, this is not necessarily your good time <laughs> it's hard work and uh, because it's hard work we need the work that you're doing to to be important for our people so um, encouraging you all to just keep going uh, and and if there are any questions that Kelsey might want to um, share with me that'd be cool cool thanks Jen um yeah, so like I said before, if you guys have questions, if you want to just chuck it into the chat, just so we're not having everyone talking over each other, that would be really good. So we'll just... I can see Edu's got lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, Edu, any questions? Edu, do you want to ask for questions? Hey, kia ora, kia ora tātou, uh, tēnā koutou e noho mai nai o koutou kāinga, uh, e noho mai nā koutou i o koutou wāhi mahi, uh, aha tūrā nei, e toro kiki ana tātou te puta i o tātou kāinga mo tētahi wāna, ko hoki mai anō tātou ki o tātou kāinga. A tua tai aki e mihi ana uh, ki te kaupapa, na i hui hui ai tahi tātou ki te aha, ki te ata whera whera i tēnei uh, kaupapa, uh, e kia nei kaupapa Māori, uh, kaupapa Māori motuhake. Um, uh, my, my, my questions, I mean, just a great presentation, and I think you fully redeemed yourself there, Jen. Kia uh, ora. Thanks for finally letting me into the hui. Um, ka pai. Uh, absolutely. Now, just why is Mātauranga Māori, uh, and you can let me know, is why is Mātauranga Māori not a theoretical framework or methodology of its own if it's not already? That's one of my questions. So the other one is... Um, are there new or old ways of exploring methodologies um, within a kaupapa Māori context? Um, yeah, and then transitioning from political, I mean, obviously that this whole de de decolonization process and um, to transformational research and outcomes from a survival to, to a flourishing mode. Kura hoki e tehua ku pātai. Uh, um, well, they're all hard questions. I think that Mātauranga Māori one, uh, the relationship between Mātauranga Māori and Kaupapa Māori is often tricky and often uh, can, um, not tricky, um, what's the word? Overlapping, right? Mātauranga, in my view, Mātauranga Māori is the body of knowledge of which Kaupapa Māori is based. Kaupapa Māori is a movement, Linda talks about it as a social movement, from which draws on Mātauranga Māori to make space. Kaipapa Māori is all about making space, just as Linda said, that very first sentence was, our, the main job of Kaipapa Māori is to make space, and for all of the, us in mainstream institutions, whether it be universities or your places of work, when we're um, trying to progress, whether it be real or tikanga, we're forever trying to make space. If I think about Kōngareo, Kurakaipapa Māori, Morayan schools in the 80s, uh, Morayan secondary schools, it's all about making that space and protecting the space. The Kaupapa Māori describes the movement to make the space. Our tauranga Māori is what feeds that space. Uh, Mātauranga Māori are the concepts that feed the, the kaupapa, if you like. So that's because the kaupapa can be whatever kaupapa it is, as you all have. Mātauranga Māori is what underpins that. So um, probably a very simplistic um, 
explanation at this point around how I'm thinking about kaipapa and mātauranga Māori. Um, are there new ways of exploring methodologies within kaipapa Māori context? Yeah, I think, um, are there new or old ways? That's right. I mean, a lot of uh, kaipapa Māori is really reclaiming, right? Kaipapa Māori is always about validating our own ways, validating and legitimating our own ways of thinking and knowing. And actually, because we've been so colonized, we have to go back and reclaim those. So they are new to academia, if you like, but they're actually our old ways. So old is the new new. Uh, it's, it's really saying our ancient innovative ways need to be legitimated and validated and thought about uh, in our new contemporary context to see what they offer us, to see whether they still hold true and some things will. And I think some things do and that's what we, you know, um, promote that actually our people always had the solutions. They had the solutions in their language and Edu, you know, you could give lots of examples um, that, that tell us how our people saw the world. I think it was talking to Edu about our, our mokopuna and, um, you know, that idea, tūpuna, mokopuna, and for those of us lucky to have mokopuna, um, you'll know what I'm, I mean, and, and that, you know, that, that word, she is that puna word, mokopuna, tūpuna, so one and the same thing. And when you're a tūpuna, like Edu and I are, and we look at our mokopuna, you start to feel that breadth of time and expanse of generations and uh, as Hardy Williams would say, you look at your babies and you see your own more, uh, that you see your own, your mortality will be, uh, what does he say? Extended or your own, you'll see your immortality. You look at your babies, your mokopuna's faces and you see your immortality because you, that puna will be continued through then. And it's a very special, very special feeling, a very special love that you have for your mokopuna as a tūpuna. So one example of the way our language holds um, some thinking about, in this case, how we should look after our babies, how we should um, think about the well-being of our tamariki, uh, the role of tūpuna, um, a whole lot of things. So just looking at any other questions. What's our time? Kelsey, we nearly finished. Um, Two more minutes. Yeah, so we have a couple. Um, Sandy has asked um, about Puraco me methodologies. So what are examples of some methods of Puraco methodologies? Some examples of Puraco methodologies. Um, Oh, kia ora koutou, kia ora Jenny. Um, actually, the question was more, uh, I, I'm actually using Pūrāko methodologies. So what are some uh, methods? It's more, not methods, not methodologies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Pūrāko, like Kaupapa Māori, is uh, broad and to be developed. Um, I think that there are, uh, I've written about you know, some principles of Pūrāko. I think there are lots of different methods in which Pūrāko can be gathered, co-created, uh, produced, shared, um, that are, again, not formulaic, uh, just as our Pūrāko spanned topics, they change with the teller, whether it was a queer telling a story or a young person or a uh, you know, depending on personalities. I mean, there's just a myriad of ways um, of, of telling Pūrāko and using Pūrāko. Um, there's been some really exciting developments of Pūrāko by um, postgraduate students, people who, and I'm just, the, for the life of me, the person's name just gone out of my head, um, just marked a PhD thesis and they used Pūrāko um, framework for analysis of whānau stories. So there's a lot of work being done in, in Pūrākai and I think, you know, 
if you go back to the principles and you think about what is it, what at this point in time is the story that, that you are hearing and feeling and needing to tell and needing to be told to make the difference and how is that going to make that difference will really help you think about the format and the method of that story, the method of the way it's to be gathered, to be listened to, to be retold, to be heard, uh, whether that's in a short story or a sort of narrative, oral type narrative. I mean, I think it's just endless. Um, yeah, so no easy answer. Namahi kia ora. Um, we have a few questions. Do, do, are you able to, uh, do you have time to answer them, Jen, or should we? Um, should we do five more minutes? Because I know people are really busy and people have to go. Please just leave. Mm, if, yeah. Um, I think, will, will, will we do, a, will you close, Kelsey? Yep, yeah, I can do or, that. Yeah. So is that okay, five more minutes? Um, Petra has asked a question as well. Petra, do you want to um, just ask her now? If you want to unmute, it might be better coming from you. I kia ora a whanau, kia ora Jenny. Um, certainly researchers within the social sciences are, are leading the field in regards to decolonialising stuff. Um, who in your, um, from your perspective, is doing similar work outside the field of social sciences, i.e. those so-called pure sciences. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Um, to be honest, I don't, my area is mainly social sciences and education, so I don't have a lot of experience in those areas. Um, I think it's few and far between, and that's why it's still hard uh, in those areas, but there are, uh, I know, PhD students, at least, doing work in sciences area, um, but I couldn't say, Peter, I'm sorry. I know that there's a lot of um, kaupapa Māori developments across a whole range of disciplines, though, from accounting, science, but they're, they're small, they're still just developing. Aroha mai. Um, so we have three more questions in the chat. Um, Afina, would you like to ask your question as well, please? Oh, kia ora. Um, tēnā koe, um, Jennifer. Nga mihi nui, kia koutou katoa. Um, it's not so much a question, it's more putting it out there that I'm struggling at the moment with the, I guess, the hard, the, the hard facts, you know, um, Decolonisation in museums, they talk about it, especially in Europe, but when it comes down to it, um, it's really hard for us to be able to, to push that. And um, so I'm sort of struggling with the, the strategies that are involved in making sure that our taonga are probably look, properly looked after around the world. And, you know, I'm just putting it out there that I'm struggling with that at the moment. Yeah, Kilda. I think that's the reality eh, of our mahi is that often there's this disjuncture between the writing of our stuff and then the everyday. And, and I know what we say around kaupapa Māori theory is it must be linked to practice. If our kaupapa Māori theories don't touch practice, then they just become elite, elitist sort of like Western theories. And we don't want that. We need our theories to make a difference and to work. Um, I always come back to, in times like this, going back to the principles, because what there's a tendency to be reductionist, that is often people who want to, and often with good intention, to help, they just want you to write, what do I do? Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And they want your 10 points. And often it's not about those 10 points, it's much more complex than that, as you know, and I know, dealing whether it be with the tonga or with the person. Um, it's not about just saying kia ora, it's not about just pronouncing their name right. Um, it's much more complex. So if you go back to the principles of what underpins that, then I think it's, um, 
a basis for people then to engage and understand really for, I think, for non-Māori to know what they don't know. To understand the depth of mā tauranga Māori and go, actually, I, I don't know any of that. I need someone who knows that to do that work. Because I've seen of recent this, this um, shift and I, and I wonder whether it's to do with you know, it's part of the normalization of te reo Māori in, in Aotearoa, which is a good thing. But there's also that this idea that with normalizing language, that is lots of people learning te reo Māori, lots of people can also be experts of our tikanga. And uh, I think that's problematic. Um, and I, I would um, guard against uh, reductionist type writing that is, I'm going to now write you the definition of manakitanga. Off you go, you can now do your manakitanga. Um, yeah. Last question. Okay, to Pai Kelsey. Um, Harina. Ora me nga nga mahi nui ki a kaita me a kui um tata kai fakahide me rangatira Jennifer and Kelsey. Yeah, um, one of the w w listening to the session, I get perturbed by the access to um the access to be a postgraduate student under the Kaupapa Māori Research uh, Fare. It's not even a tick on the application form, do you want to be a kaupapa Māori researcher? So at the operation, while well, we are trying to do as much as we can theoretically, at the operational end, the universities are denying us to walk into our own whare tupuna or whare mātauranga. So where is, so we are in the scheme of things, um, at the moment, I'm a you know I'm currently a Massey University student, and and Kopapa Māori Research is up and running there. Um, the other half of Linda Smith happens to be a ABC up there. So, um, but still, it was never an option in the application form to be a Kopapa Māori researcher at that postgraduate level. Mm. Can you elaborate more, or can anyone, if they can? Is there forward thinking in that space? Future thinking in that space? Or are we still going to have to be going, jumping around a few fences, through a few gates to get into the paddock or to get into our own whare? Mm. You know? Yeah. I, I don't know. If, I can't answer that question. I'm, I, um, I can only relate to it um, as someone who's, who's come through... Um, you know, just mainstream institutions and at every level. Um, and I think that's a struggle. That's a struggle for Kaupapa Māori that we are trying to make the space, the space is tenuous and we've got to keep it open. I think Kaupapa Māori research, as Graham and Linda and others will talk about, is about, um, at the end of the day, living it. And if we just write about it, yeah, yeah. We, and we don't go and you know support and mentor others uh support your 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 mates that are doing kaipapa maori research and your postgraduate um peers uh, if we don't support each other this is not a competition this is about supporting each other all get through to all get through whether it be young or old or where we are in this journey of academia or understanding kaipapa maori We've got to be doing this together because yep. you're right, we won't get through and it's too, it becomes too hard. Yeah. So just, um, I suppose, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it, it's a challenge for me uh, and, and Alfano to keep, to keep adhering to, you know, I can write, we can write this stuff, but we have to do it in our homes. We have to tell our stories every day mm. to our kids. We have to speak Māori. I have to be committed to supporting Mikey Wairaka and our Maya Fano, uh, our students here, et cetera, et cetera, for Thank it you. to actually work. So kia kaha, koe, koutou. No, no, no. 
I just sort of was, um, I just wanted to ask that question I, if you had any insights. Thank you and thank you everybody. I'm gone. Kapai. Ooh. Um, there was one more, but if you don't, if we do need to cut it here, that's fine. Um, what? Did you want the last question or? I take a pie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, one more. Okay, Sharon, could you um unmute? Uh, tēnā, uh, tēnā te whānau, um, tēnā koe jini, nā mihi. So I was just curious, I was thinking about um, part of my research is around Māori, uh, has to do with a Māori community within a school context and the whole notion of flourishing, resilient, I suppose, or, you know, using um, the, the notion of tinoranga, tiratanga, and just being caught between um, that community wanting to know what so what does flourishing look like what how do we define that what is that and not wanting to put my um i suppose perspective into that at the moment but because that is part of what we are looking at i, I wonder how to how to how to what do you think about that or how do we define what a, a flourishing maori community might might bring i know there is lots of things about that oh. Kia ora Sharon, so nice to see you and I'm so pleased you're doing your uh, doctoral studies. Um, yeah, good question. Flourishing for our whānau, Edu and I. <laughs> Flourishing for another whānau can, can be completely different, right? Um, so uh, enacting that tenoranga tiratanga is to really enable those whānau to tell you what flourishing is for them. Um, and I think... Um, yeah, I, th I, I would, and you may find that just as the word success is used differently, the same as flourishing will be used differently, that there's this normative view of what flourishing is that comes from a very uh, Western normative framework, that actually our, our communities may or may not think similarly. So I think to... Um, investigate and interrogate what does flourishing mean what does it look like what does it feel like what does it feel like is a good one what does it smell like what does it taste like um, and get our people talking about examples of um, how do you measure flourishing you know what do they see what's an example of flourishing to them starts to give life to those words that become a little bit like rhetoric and especially in policy, um, government papers, ministry papers, they put in these, pop in these words like flourishing as if we all know what that means. Um, but to keep pushing, you know, flourishing might mean to, um, to learn Māori, might mean to have karaki every day, might mean whatever it is. So I think just uh, keep and, and they don't have to be the same as the rest of the school. And the closer we get to understanding the differences and distinguishing between, you know, what the school means by flourishing and what whānau, and, this, and they might differ between whānau, right? Um, I think it's really helpful. Not sure if that's answered that, Sharon. Kia ora. Thank you, Jenny. Kapai, kwa matu.